Hi there, I'm Dr. Sanjay Krishnan and I teach data science at the University of Chicago. In less than a week, we will witness one of the most anticipated elections in American history. We all have predictions and opinions of what's going to take place next Tuesday night. While we can't truly know the outcome for certain until all the votes are cast and counted, initial opinion polls are going to give us some idea of what might happen. As an educator and researcher, in data analytics, I thought I'd take some time to demystify the science of opinion polling and what, if anything, we can predict from these polls. Polling is as much of an art as it is a science, and it seems like today everyone has their own set of numbers. In the driver's seat, the double-digit lead in national polling averages and a lopsided advantage. You see it right here in our CNN electoral outlook. Look at this. The, the president, we play that clip. He says he thinks you're going to win this easily. Um, do you think the polls, when you lay out that electoral college uh, 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 pathway there, do you think the polls right now, because we just put the averages up there, this is the totality of everything, are they missing your voters in these states? Or is it your belief that in the last week you're going to get people to change their minds? Well, I think it's largely that they're missing our voters and if they have the weighting wrong. Uh, and at this point, everything has to be a likely voter if you're doing any sort of polling. So why is there so much room for disagreement on something seemingly objective and quantitative? And what is weighting and why is this so important? These are the questions that we will get to in this election special lecture. To understand polling, we have to start with the basics of random sampling. So we start our discussion of opinion polling by discussing our voting population. Our voting population is a set of individuals who vote in our electorate. This particular voting population, as an example, votes 40% orange and 60% pink. Now the basic problem in opinion polling is that we can't exhaustively ask every single individual in this voting population to tell us what their vote is before election day. So we have to rely on a sample. A sample is a representative collection of individuals from this voting population. Now this particular sample is a very good sample. It exactly matches the original population distribution. For example, there are 40% orange and 60% pink. But not every sample is this good. In case we got this sample over here, we could have 60% orange and 40% pink, which is off by 20%. Or we could have an even worse sample that is 80% orange and 20% pink. So different samples are going to have different estimates. Some samples are going to underestimate the percentage of orange votes. Some samples are going to overestimate the percentage of orange votes. Some are going to be further away from the true value. Some are going to be closer to the true value. Now the general principle is that as the sample size increases, the error in your estimate is going to go down. Intuitively, there is less wiggle room to be too different from the breakdown of the full voting population. We can visualize this effect on this little toy graph over here. As you increase the sample size, more of your estimates are closer and closer to the true value. Small samples tend to be spread out further apart from the true value, larger samples tend to be close to the true value. And it is exactly this type of graph that constructs a term that you may have seen on the news called the margin of error. The margin of error is the range around the true value where the vast majority of samples are going to lie. Now there's an entire body of literature on how to calculate these margins of error. I like to use the following rule of thumb. The vast majority of samples are going to lie plus minus one over square root of the sample size. So that means that you're going to add a little bit to the true value and you're going to subtract a little bit for the true value. And in this range, the vast majority of samples lie. How do we sort of make sense of this equation? Let's think about a sample size of 100. The, the estimates that you get from a sample are going to lie roughly within 10% of the true value. For a sample size of 10,000, they're going to lie roughly between 1% of the true value. So this theory is great in principle, but why is there still a disagreement on opinion polling results? Well, simply put, not everyone who can vote does vote, and not everyone who does vote responds to an opinion poll. So the basic idea of sampling from a voting population is great in principle. However, 
in practice, the picture looks much more complicated. Different populations turn out to vote at different levels, and different populations respond to your poll affirmatively in different, in, at different levels. And because of this, it's much more challenging to actually construct this representative sample. Because the people who actually do respond to your poll may not vote, and the people who do vote may not actually respond to your poll. So in practice, we end up having to do something called stratification, where we break a voting population into strata, or segments that we believe are roughly homogenous roughly homogenous in voting behavior and polling behavior. That means that they, are, they turn out to vote at roughly the same rate and they respond to your polls at roughly the same rate. For example, we might break down our population based on age groups. So the reality of polling estimates is that they are much more complicated than the simple sampling scheme that I showed you before, that the estimates are composed of many small sub-estimates for different strata of the population. Some of them are going to vote more frequently, some of them are going to vote less frequently. And that frequency of voting is exactly what you might hear on the news as a weight. The expected turnout of the group divided by the total expected turnout. So every estimate in an opinion poll is constructed by a weighted average of the different sub-estimates of each one of the strata. Now those weights are going to be bets. You make these weights based on historical judgments about how different groups may respond to certain candidates or may respond to voting in general. And those bets can be off. So if we underestimate a certain group's voting turnout or when we overestimate another group's voting turnout, we might have some issues with the way that we construct our estimate. So every estimate is going to have two sources of error. You might have a bad guess about turnout, or you might have too small of a sample size. So with all of that, we can see that modern opinion polls can best be described as confidently wrong. We can reach a very large number of people inexpensively, driving down the margin of error. The problem is, are those the people who are actually going to turn out to vote? So the weights that we use to construct an estimate are bets based on historical demographic trends at best and shameless optimism from campaigns at worst. Your confidence in a pollster is less about their ability to have a low margin of error, but more about their ability to predict weights, how different population strata might turn out to vote. So polls fail to predict an election when these weights are systematically incorrect. By systematic, we mean that many experts get it wrong in the same way. For example, in the 2016 election, we failed to understand just how significantly Donald Trump would encourage turnout among voters without a college degree. This was historically a demographic that didn't always turn out for elections. Such adjustments are now baked into the results that you see. In every subsequent election, we learn more and more about the behavior of the electorate, and we can incorporate these into how we construct these weights to account for different turnout ratios. So opinion polls are very good comparative tools. It is often useful to zero in on one of these subpopulations, for example, college educated women 18 to 25, and understand how the subpopulation, how the subelectorate has transitioned over time, over a series of elections. And this is really valuable because most US elections in, in our recent memory have been decided by relatively small margins. So any significant change in one of these subpopulations is often enough to tip the balance of the elections. So when considering how a subpopulation has changed, it's often important to, to think about th this change on two axes. First, there's the axes, the vertical axis in my plot, about whether there's a change in voting preference. For example, more vote pink or more vote orange. Then we also have to simultaneously consider the change in the weight of this subpopulation. Are more of this subpopulation turning out relative to the original electorate? So if we play something like a previous election result at the center, we can use these two axes to judge whether there's been a significant difference in voting behavior that might tip the balance. And this is especially useful in understanding how narrow elections may play out. For example, if 
2020 turns out to be more, more towards the upper right-hand quadrant, we know that there's an advantage to pink. Not only is one particular subpopulation voting more pink, they're also increasing their voting weight. Now, if 2020 turns out to go the other way into the lower right-hand quadrant, we see that there's an advantage to orange. Now, in this particular diagram, you really want to be on the right half of this diagram. Because if you're, if you're considering subpopulations that are losing weight, this could in, indicate a lack of enthusiasm. Less of this subpopulation is turning out to vote. Now, you could also have a situation where you are improving your voting fraction in these subpopulations, but they are also decreasing weight. This could indicate that the voting base that you're, trust, that you're trusting to, to turn out for your elections is shrinking over time. So really this means that it's not enough to look at an opinion poll and think about which side each group or each subgroup is voting for. You also have to think about the turnout of this group. But it's really easy to get duped by errant pollsters, right? Don't trust someone who says that they have predicted the last five elections or the last seven elections, because nothing is easier than predicting the past. Now, so, so much of the accuracy of these opinion polls is based on the weights that you choose and your bet about how different groups are going to turn out, it's really easy to get duped by errant pollsters. Some of these bets are going to be good and some of them are going to be bad. I just want to illustrate this, I just want to illustrate this effect with a simple thought experiment. Imagine we had eight pollsters who were trying to predict the last three elections, 2008, 2012, and 2016. Now, these pollsters actually are kind of tricky. They don't use any science to predict these polls and they simply flip a random coin and pick a random party to win the election. Now, if the, even if these pollsters used no science and we considered eight of these pollsters, we would expect that one of them actually got the elections right, got the predictions right. This is the danger of zeroing in on the one pollster that seems to have predicted the past properly. It is not indicative of them being able to predict the next election. So all of this seems really subjective, and in all honesty, it actually is. But computing allows us to change this equation. Instead of zeroing in on the one pollster who we like, who we trust, who we pay for in our campaign, we can use computer simulations to understand the effects of many, many, many different turnout scenarios. For example, here is an electoral college map for the current election assuming that there was a turnout similar to the 2016 election for Donald Trump. Now we can change the turnout. Let's look at an electoral college map for a single opinion poll, assuming that all eligible voters from 18 to 24 turn out to vote. Now here's what happens if none of them turn out to vote. All of these maps look very, very different and highlight a different turnout scenario. Computers can simulate a large number of such scenarios over and over again and build up a distribution of outcomes for an election. While most pollsters are tight-lipped about exactly how they come up with odds for predicting an election, we can guess that the methodology is similar to what I told you about. They're based on simulations that integrate many different bets about turnout and different polling scenarios. However, like any bet, there's some probability that they are right and there's some probability that they are wrong. And you need to take the poller's credibility into account when judging those odds. In our rapidly changing 2020 world, there is a lot that can happen between now and election day. Hopefully this video lecture explains more about the science about the numbers that you see and allows you to understand the numbers that you see on the news a little bit better.